Thankful that you are here today at Little Creek Fellowship and thankful to welcome those of you who are watching us through our internet online ministry. Would you bow your hearts together with me in prayer? Father God, we pause to thank you for what we are experiencing with you and one another in this place today. And now realizing the importance of what we are about to study, I offer myself as a vessel, a fresh and new into your hands today. Please cleanse me with the washing of the blood of your dear Son. Please anoint me with the power of your sweet Holy Spirit, so that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart will be acceptable in your sight, so that your purpose, your design purpose, might be accomplished for each of us as individuals, as families, and as a church collective. Because this prayer I pray, and praises for victories I give in Christ's name, amen. In our previous session, I shared the first reason why I am a Sabbath-keeping Christian. I'm a Sabbath-keeping Christian because it was kept in the beginning. In today's session, we are looking at reason number two. I am a Sabbath-keeping Christian because it was kept by Jesus. After graduating from Pentecostal and Baptist seminaries and spending several years as a Sunday-keeping Christian pastor, revivalist, Bible college professor, and administrator, I had learned many valuable facts, many important principles. But the greatest lesson was still yet to be learned. That being, there were a lot of things I did not yet know. And this prompted me to determine to examine for myself what I had been taught by professors and research the doctrines of the scripture, of the Bible, for myself with as little outside influence as possible so as not to be swayed by or make decisions on the basis of popular opinion. As I did so, there was a thorn that kept needling me, and that thorn concerned the Lord's Day. As much as I dreaded it, I knew that sooner or later, this subject would have to be analyzed in the light of what God's Word not tradition, not popular opinion, but in the light of what God's word says on the subject. And so the question, Sabbath of Christianity, Sunday or Saturday became almost a constant thought. My journey revolved around two major questions. Number one, was the Sabbath of the Old Testament confirmed by Christ in the New Testament? And number two, was the Sabbath of the Old Testament kept by the apostles? In today's session, I'm going to deal with question one. In the next session, I'm going to deal with question two. Question one. Was the Sabbath of the Old Testament confirmed by Christ in the New Testament? I remember thinking of the books I had read and the preachers I had heard that proposed that we on this side of the death and resurrection of Christ are no longer bound to keep the Seventh-day Sabbath. 
This was based on the idea that the Seventh-day Sabbath was of the Jewish law system, and we as Christians are now under the system of grace. It was contended that the law was nailed to the cross. And the law was replaced by a better covenant. A covenant that has Sunday as its day of worship. And I myself had preached this, I had taught this for many years. Since I had been taught, and since I had taught others, that the Sabbath is part of the law given just for Israel by God to Moses, I reasoned that what I needed to do was to table as much as possible what I had been taught from books, what I had been taught by professors, and just allow the Bible, the Word of God, to paint its own portrait of Christ's relationship with the law. In order to do this, I decided that I would seek to answer this question. Did the death of Jesus destroy the law? It became evident almost immediately that I could solve a part of this question by recognizing and admitting, and sometimes it's difficult to do, isn't it? By recognizing and admitting that the Bible makes a distinction between the ceremonial law and the moral law. Now, please follow me very closely here. The ceremonial law included the guidelines for offerings and various sacrifices and the honoring of certain religious days in conjunction with those offerings and sacrifices. The ceremonial law sought to impress upon Israel the necessity of looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. On the other hand, the moral law I discovered from God's word is a code of ethics. A code of ethics that was given to mankind by God at the time of creation. And this code of ethics was given to instruct us in a consistent relationship and fellowship we can have with both deity and with humanity. The more law consists of ten commandments. And the more law, the Ten Commandments, was shared with man a long time before Exodus chapter 20. The more law of God deals with love for God in the first four commandments. The more law of God deals with love for man, for one another, in the last six commandments. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 14 became a portion of scripture upon which I meditated daily for weeks. Listen closely as Paul wrote, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way, nailing it to the cross. After pondering this text for days and for weeks, I reached two concrete conclusions. Number one, some things were nailed to the cross. 
Number two, some things were not nailed to the cross. I arrived at this conclusion that some things were not nailed to the cross by asking myself and answering myself. Have you ever done that? By asking myself and answering myself a series of questions based on what the Bible says about sin. Now, before we look at these questions, we need to be reminded of a very important Bible principle. It's found in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4. Listen closely. Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also what? That's right. The Bible says, whosoever committeth sin also transgresseth the law. For sin is the transgression of what? The law. the law. So the Bible says sin is the transgression of the law. Question. Will you agree with me that 1 John chapter 3 and verse 4 that we just read was written after the death and resurrection of Jesus? Yes. Will you agree with me on that? Now, why is that important? Very simple. This principle was a principle in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant. It was a principle in the Old Testament under the Old Covenant that sin is the transgression of the law. But... It is also a principle in the New Testament under the New Covenant. Sin is the transgression of the law. Now, you need to make sure you understand me very clearly here. Keeping the moral law, keeping the Ten Commandments will not save us. But keeping the moral law, keeping the Ten Commandments after we become by faith and faith alone a child of God through the power of God's Holy Spirit will enable us to resist the devil and the sin he wants us to commit. Now please remember this principle as we now ask ourselves the following questions as I asked myself many years ago as a Pentecostal Christian pastor. Number one, since the cross, has it ever been right to have other gods before Jehovah? Since the cross, has it ever been right to make graven images? No. Since the cross, has it ever been right to take the name of the Lord in vain? No. Since the cross, has it ever been right to dishonor father and mother? No. Since the cross, has it ever been right to kill? Since the cross, has it ever been right to commit adultery? Since the cross, has it ever been right to steal? Since the cross, has it ever been right to bear false witness? Since the cross, has it ever been right to covet the belongings of a neighbor? The answer to each of those questions was then when I asked myself, and still is today a resounding no. Now, I may be simplistic. And I shared with you last week that some people actually think I'm simple-minded. But that's all right. God impressed me a long time ago. Just keep it simple, short, and sweet. I may be simplistic, 
But I concluded in my mind and in my heart that if these nine aspects of the moral law of the Ten Commandments were not nailed to the cross and made void, if they were not done away with, it stands to scriptural, ethical reasoning that the seventh day Sabbath of the fourth commandment should remain in force along with the other nine. If the death of Jesus did not destroy the moral law, the Ten Commandments, what was nailed to the cross? The ceremonial law. As Paul expressed and said, the handwriting of ordinances. Now let's read again Colossians 2, 14 that we read a few moments ago. Blotting out what? <laughs> Blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us and took it. Now what is the it? The it is referring to the handwriting of ordinances and took it out of the way, nailing it. What is the it again? The it is referring to the handwriting of ordinances, nailing it to the cross. You see, the ceremonial law had indeed directed mankind as a schoolmaster to look forward. To look forward to the supreme sacrifice of Jesus, the Lamb of God, slain from the foundation of the world. But the moral law pointed man backward. Backward to remember the perfect work of creation and all that was set in motion for the good of the entire human family in our relationship with God and in our relationship with one another. Why did Jesus come into the world? I'm convicted in my intellect and I'm convinced in my emotions that Jesus came into the world to reconcile fallen man unto a loving Father God. Which law did he nullify and replace as he offered himself as the fulfillment of the sacrificial system? The ceremonial. Listen to how Paul expressed it in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 15. He, speaking of Jesus... He abolished in his flesh, and underscore, the law of commandments contained where? The law of commandments contained in ordinances. And I remember, as I was studying this verse of Scripture, reading over and over and over again the Ten Commandments, and not one time did I discover any thing in the Ten Commandments that remotely hints at an ordinance. An ordinance is not there. You see, Christ's death did not abolish the Ten Commandments, the moral law. Christ's death did away with, removed the law of commandments contained in ordinances. As I read through the four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, looking for Christ's relationship with the law, I found nothing in his birth. I found nothing in his ministry. I found nothing in his death. I found nothing in his resurrection. I found nothing in his ascension that removed the Ten Commandments. 
the Ten Commandments from being a bountiful blessing for anyone who keeps them in our generation today. But what I did discover was this in the Gospels. It became more and more and more apparent that Jesus came to this world to redeem man and to fill us with his sweet Holy Spirit so that we can obey in faith the moral law of God. You see, nowhere in the Gospels is Jesus presented as either condemning or changing the Ten Commandments. But instead, he is seen constantly confirming the moral law of God, and the Seventh day Sabbath is part of that moral law. In Hebrews chapter 10, I marveled at the delightful description of Christ's relationship with both the ceremonial law and the moral law. First of all, I want us to notice concerning Christ's relationship to the ceremonial law. Hebrews chapter 10, beginning in verse number 4. For it is impossible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sins. Wherefore, when he, speaking of Jesus, wherefore, when he cometh into the world, he saith, Sacrifice and offerings thou, God, wouldest not, but a body hast thou prepared me. In burnt offerings and sacrifices for sin, thou, underscore, hast had no pleasure. Then said I, Lo, I come in the volume of the book it is written of me to do thy will, O God. Above when he said, Sacrifice and offering and burnt offerings and offering for sin, thou wouldest not, neither underscore, hadst pleasure therein which are offered by the law. And so Christ's relationship with the ceremonial law was to remove it. Christ's relationship to the ceremonial law was to take it away by becoming the ultimate sacrifice himself. Aren't you thankful for this? We no longer have to kill a little lamb and offer a sacrifice, but rather by faith. Not of works, lest any man should boast, but by faith and faith alone, we accept the sacrifice of Christ for us, and we are saved by His amazing grace. Is there anybody else here besides me who just feels like saying hallelujah about now? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Second, let's take a look at Christ's relationship to the moral law. I continue reading in Hebrews 10, verses 16 and 17. This is the covenant. Now, let me pause here, reading just a few moments as the scripture remains on the screen and ask this question. God is going to make what? He's going to make a covenant, right? Now, I want you to notice what will be part of this new covenant that God is going to make. Let's continue reading. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days. And after those days is referring to the death and resurrection and ascension of Christ. He says, this is the new covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my what? One more time. I will put my what? One more time. I will put my what? I will put my laws, underscore, in their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Did you notice in this text how victory regarding sins and iniquities has to do with this new covenant? Did you notice this? And this new covenant 
has as a necessary ingredient God's laws written in the heart and the mind of the believer in Jesus Christ. Did you notice that? Also, do you remember another time when the Bible records that God wrote something? It's in the Old Testament. What did he write? He wrote the Ten Commandments. And the Bible says he wrote them with his own finger. Isn't it interesting that both times God is referred to in the Bible as writing, his writing is to write his moral laws? The first time he wrote it on tables of stone. And the second time he is writing it on the hearts and minds of those who will accept Jesus as Savior and Lord. The scripture passage in Hebrews 10 verses 16 and 17, I reason, has to be referring to the moral law of the Ten Commandments. Now follow me closely. It has to. Because why would God so honor the ceremonial law of sacrifices and offerings by putting them into hearts and minds if he no longer found pleasure in them, as we read in verse 6 just a few minutes ago? You see, the Bible teaches that Christ would not remove the moral law, but rather Christ would establish the moral law, the Ten Commandments, to be part of the new covenant. Let's read again, Hebrews 10, verses 16 and 17. This is the covenant I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds will I write them. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. You see, when a person accepts Jesus and the sacrifice of Christ by faith, God desires at that moment to impress his Ten Commandments into the heart and into the mind by the work of the Holy Spirit so that the believer in Jesus can now distinguish between what is evil, and what is good. And thus, by a walk of obedience, be empowered to resist sin and iniquity. I think I will say hallelujah one more time. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. What was Christ's relationship to the moral law? The most authoritative voice I know on the subject is his own voice. I read from Matthew chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. From the gracious lips of our Savior we hear, Think not that I am come to destroy what? The law. The law or the prophets, but to fulfill. Amen. For verily I send to you, underscore, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from what? From the law till all be fulfilled. Question. Is the heaven still in existence? Is the earth still in existence? The heaven and the earth is still in existence. And because the heaven and earth is still in existence, the moral law is still in existence. And no amount of popular opinion can do away with it. No amount of ACLU lawsuits can do away with it. No amount of biased court rulings can do away with it. The posting of the moral law, the Ten Commandments, can be legislated out of our society. 
It can be removed from every piece of property on planet earth. But Jesus promised that as long as the heaven and the earth exist, not one dotting of an I or one crossing of a T shall pass from the moral law, the Ten Commandments. And I propose to us, my friends, that our nation, I propose to us that our world is in the condition we are in because we have, as a society, been taught, we teach, and we practice that the Ten Commandments are no longer relevant and valid. Now, by this time in my study, I must admit that I was getting somewhat angry. Angry because of what I had been taught by others, and angry because of what I had taught to others. I was a living example of the first part of Matthew 5, verse 19. Whosoever therefore, and whenever you see the word therefore, it needs to be linked with what has just been written or said. Now, what has just been said by Jesus? He has been talking about the commandments, right? And Jesus said, wherefore, therefore, whosoever shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. And I can still remember the moment when God's spirit drove that deep in my mind and in my heart and I fell to my knees crying and I asked God to forgive me. You see, I had been taught that it was all right to break a part of God's moral law. And I, in turn, had instructed others to violate one of the Ten Commandments. I was a preacher, and yet I was instructing people to break God's law, to violate the Fourth Commandment. Remember the seventh Sabbath to keep it holy. Why was it so important for me to spend this time, so much time distinguishing between the ceremonial law and, and the moral law? And discovering Christ's relationship to each one, the answer is very simple. Jesus is our perfect example. And because he's our perfect example, he is fully capable of leading us into a complete relationship with our Heavenly Father. But it's not enough just to know this in the mind. It must become a conviction of the heart. A conviction of the heart strong enough to cause us to practice what Christ practiced. Even though it may not be the custom and practice of the majority of the world. Even though it may not be the custom and practice of the majority of the Christian church. Even though it may not be the custom and practice of our family even though it may not be the custom and practice of our friends. John expressed it like this in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 6. He that saith he abideth in Jesus ought himself also so to walk, and underscore this, even as Jesus walked. And I want you to notice that this walk is linked according to verses 3 through 5 to the keeping of the commandments. Let's back up and begin reading. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his what? If we keep his commandments. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Because whoso keepeth his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected, and hereby know we that we are in 
him. My study of the Lord's Day was igniting a greater degree within me to become a closer friend with Jesus. And there was being born in me a desire to keep the seventh Sabbath because Jesus kept it holy. And Jesus kept it holy because it's the Lord's Day. It belongs to him. And I was becoming more and more convicted in my intellect and convinced in my emotions that both the Old and the New Testaments agree on this point. And it was beginning to pound in my mind and in my heart like a great message of hope. In closing, perhaps I need to share just a few passages that were giving direction in my life to the area of the Lord's Day being Saturday, the 70th Sabbath, and not Sunday. Revelation chapter 1 and verse 10. I was in the Spirit on what? On the Lord's Day, and heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Now question. Will you agree with me that neither Sunday or Saturday is mentioned in this verse? Now why is this important? Very simple. It's important because there is nothing in this immediate verse to establish the day to either be Sunday or Saturday. And so we must allow scripture and not tradition or popular opinion to interpret scripture. The Bible is its own best commentary. I have a number of commentary sets in my library. But if you were to ask me what is my most valued commentary on the Bible, I would hold up this book. The Bible itself. When I was in Sunday school class as a young boy growing up in the Pentecostal church, one of my Sunday school teachers made this statement. Young people, if you ever read something in God's word you don't understand, keep on reading because God's word will explain itself. Amen. Question. Since we are discussing the Lord's day and whether or not Jesus confirmed the seventh day Sabbath, Will you agree with me that it is only proper to allow him to speak for himself? Amen. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 8. Underscore. For the Son of Man is Lord. And who's that talking about? Talking about Jesus, right? And the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath day. And so it's clear that Jesus is saying the Sabbath day is connected with the lordship of himself. Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 through 11 shed further insight into which day, Sunday the first day of the week, or Saturday the seventh uh, day is the Lord's day. Listen closely. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. And underscore... But the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. And so the seventh day is explicitly referred to as the Lord's Sabbath. Or we might say the Lord's day. Later, the prophet Isaiah was inspired to declare the reverence due God on his day by recording how God himself views the seventh day Sabbath. Listen to what God says in Isaiah 58 and verse 13. Underscore. My holy day. Now what did God call it? He said it's my holy day, the holy of who? Lord. The holy of the Lord. And again, how can I argue with Jesus himself? Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28. And Jesus said unto them, The Sabbath was made for man, and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, on this basis, underscore, 
The Son of Man is Lord also of the Sabbath. Now again, I may be simplistic, but I choose to believe that if God says the Sabbath is His holy day, then it must be just what He says. His day. The Lord's day. I came to believe on the basis of what the Bible says. Not other books, not my family, not professors, not preachers, not public opinion. I came to believe on the basis of what the Bible says that Christ not only confirmed the seventh day Sabbath with his words, he also confirmed it with his actions. Following his baptism and the great wilderness temptation, Jesus began to travel throughout the region and teach the people. I take us to Luke chapter 4 and verse 16. And Jesus came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And underscore, as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. Yes, search though I did for days, for weeks, and for months. Search though I did. I could not produce even one verse to indicate to the slightest degree that Jesus either replaced or meant for the seventh day Sabbath to be abolished. After researching question one, was the Sabbath of the Old Testament confirmed by Christ in the New Testament? I had to conclude that if Saturday, the seventh day Sabbath, was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for those who desire to live up to the title of being a Christian. Amen. Because to be a sincere Christian is to be like Christ. And to be like Christ is to follow his example. And the example of Jesus confirmed the seventh day Sabbath. And Saturday, the seventh day Sabbath, <coughs> is the Lord's day. But someone may be asking, Dan, didn't the disciples and the apostles change the day of Christian worship from Saturday to Sunday? That's a valid question. In our next session, we're going to look at question number two. Was the Sabbath of the Old Testament kept by the apostles? And we are going to allow the Bible, not public opinion, to answer that question.